Hey guys, welcome back to another one. Today we'll be discussing common questions and also mistakes made with dermestid beetles, also known as flesh eating beetles or skull cleaning beetles. Right off the bat, I want to let you guys know that we got our beetles from Walks Again Taxidermy. If you are interested in getting your own, go to the description of the video and head over to their website and let them know that we sent you for a discount. Our setup and closure video I highly recommend you watch as it has helped a lot of people and lots of these questions we are answering are coming from there from the comments and also common mispractices I have seen on forums and more. Starting off with the heat sink. A lot of people wonder why you'd put a heat sink inside of there. The main reason is to store a lot of that heat instead of it being stored in the air which really does not hold heat very well. You put in something really dense like patio pavers and that really creates a good area for that heat to suck into and it allows you to use less energy while you're having your beetles. There are many other ways that you can store heat whether it's through water and milk jugs or something of the sort. Patio pavers was just nice and easy as they fit perfectly in that corner spot and they just did what I needed to at the time. Some people were wondering what patio pavers I used. It really does not matter what patio pavers you use. I just used the ones that I had. They're a little larger. They're about foot by foot, roughly, and about two inches tall. Used a bunch of them in order to create that nice depth. I cleaned them all off as they were outside prior to being used. I didn't want to bring any bugs or anything like that inside the enclosure that could harm the beetles that I paid for. Went ahead and put aluminum tape around all of it just in case there was something that I missed it wouldn't be able to get out and it just made it look a little nicer. Some people were wondering how you clean the enclosure. Now I haven't cleaned the enclosure myself besides taking out the styrofoam blocks once they're all used up. At that point, I bring it up above, let it hang there until a lot of the beetles go back down in order to go eat off of the tray, and then I just toss it away like normal garbage. But for cleaning the enclosure itself, where all the aspen and stuff is, I don't really do that as below the aspen and all the paper clippings, there's going to become a layer of frass, is what it is called. It's very fine dust, and if you take it out a lot, that is going to cause your colony to not grow as fast because a lot of those smaller larvae and stuff end up going down into the frass. So it's not something that I really concern myself with as it does grow so slowly over time. At some point, you can clean it out. From what I've seen, you put on a nice mask in order to not get any of those fine particles in your lungs. So like a respirator or such. And then once you do that, you can scrape above the top layer, move everything over, grab all the frass you can, put it in a separate container, put a nice plastic container inside of that, put a piece of meat in there so any that are sitting in that frass will go in there and they can't get back out. So you're trying to save your colony as much as you can. Do that for a few days and then toss that frass out as anything that's left in there is negligible. More so why you clean it out is due to smell. That's the main reason why you pull it out of your enclosure. And that's completely up to you. Some people do it every six months, some do it every couple years. So it's really dependent on your preference. Another question that I received was, is it safe to cut into a freezer and what do you use to do so? Yes, it is safe to cut into the freezer. You may hit a line or two inside of it. Depending on your freezer, more than likely you're getting a free freezer that doesn't work. So more than likely there's no coolant or anything like that in there. And then you'll take a circular bit on a power drill and you'll just drill right through one side and then you'll come from the other side and do the same as there's two outer shells to the freezer. There's the outside, you know, sheet metal and then there's interior wall. In between it, there's just insulation. So you'll cut it from each side to make a nice clean cut, pull it all out and then you have your nice hole for your fan or for whatever you're doing. Then you just use a normal drill bit on there. A lot of people were wondering how many beetles are in the enclosure in this particular video. 
There's about 10,000 to 15,000 beetles in that enclosure and they clean the skulls particularly the beaver and the coyote skulls in about a day and you can even put two in there and they'll eat both of them in a day so it's all up to you how fast you want your colony to grow you put more food in there so they can keep growing or if you want to try to slow them down you know put less food in there but you could hamper your generational gaps Another question that I received was when you're talking about putting styrofoam into the freezer for them to pupate are you referring to like popcorn block, styrofoam, or more couch cushion stuff? In this video you can see a couple different types that I had. One is the smaller pieces are from a TV that we bought, all the styrofoam around it. You go ahead break it up on the sides that way they can get into it easier. That stuff works great. It holds together very well. And then the other stuff you see that's a little darker than that and more cubish colored. That's the stuff that you get from, you know, when you get something shipped from China or something like that in a bigger container. They put these big blocks of styrofoam wrapped real tightly in plastic. Pull away that plastic, cut it in half, and it works perfectly for them to go in and pupate. You can use cotton balls, squish down, couch cushions, stuff like that, but I found that that stuff just doesn't hold together as well. And with that, it makes a lot more of a mess in the closure, so you have to try to keep it clean more often. Whereas this stuff, it holds it together very well. You can put it in the corners, make it look you know, as presentable as you can, and go from there. Another question that I got was regarding to the ink birds that I have on the enclosure. One for humidity and then the other one for temperature. The temperature is just hooked into that radiant heat lamp inside of the enclosure with the internal thermostat of the ink bird right inside of the enclosure taped in there. That thermometer will let us know the ink bird in particular will let it know if it needs to turn on that heat lamp then it'll turn it on once it builds up that heat again it'll turn it off and just keep that cycle going the ink bird that i had in the video was a wi-fi controlled one so i could even change the temperature if i felt like and you could also see the history which is why i learned actually how much a difference the heat sink made in itself Without the heat sink in there, the radiant heat lamp would have to turn on every 15 minutes in order to heat the enclosure back on for about 15 minutes, turn itself off. So it was running 30 minutes every hour, which granted it's not a lot of electricity costs associated with it, but if you can trim that down for a free thing, once I put in the heat sink of, I believe four or five patio pavers, that in itself created a very nice thing where it only took 15 minutes every hour to keep the enclosure heated up. And in regards to the humidity ink bird, that one is pretty pretty easy as well. I have it connected to the PC fan that's pulling the air out of the enclosure, not pushing it in. That way, with my setup, I had it routed out of a window. And if I was pulling in air into the enclosure, first it wouldn't work very well because it's tried to keep very snug, so it would be trying to push air into a already crowded space. Due to that, and also it gets really cold here in Minnesota, about, you know, less than zero degrees at some points, pushing in that air would drastically hurt the beetles and also hurt the radiant heat lamp trying to do what it does. So pulling that air out instead tries, tries to keep the air pretty fresh and it gets rid of the smell without pushing it into the enclosure where it can seep out of the enclosure into the various areas. If you have it in a shed or a garage or something like that, that's not something that you would want. So for the humidifier, I had it in there at a certain percentage and then once it would go above, I believe it was about 60% in the video at that time, it would start sucking, or 40%. It would start sucking that air out, drying out that area, especially during their feeding times. That's when most of the moisture would come from because those heads were frozen. It would suck all that air out until it brought it back down. 
Yes, it took a little bit longer because it's not a very powerful fan, but you also don't want to overdo it as well. Another question that I got was not in particular to the video, but it was about degreasing and how I go about doing it. What I do is I go and put them in a big jug or tub, whatever you can fit them in, put a lot of Dawn dish soap or Ajax in there with water, put it out in the sun so it can get a nice bit of heat onto it, dump it out every few days, put extra in there, and just do that process over and over until you don't see all that scum on top of the water line, and that will show you that it is ready to go. Now you could do it in heated water as well where you put it in a crock pot or something like that. That's an extra step which you can do but that does weaken the skull whenever you put heat onto it so it's really up to each person for that. A lot of people were wondering what temperature and what humidity percentage you're looking to have for the beetles. For my particular enclosure I had my fans start kicking on for the humidifier or dehumidifier rather once it reaches 55% humidity or greater that way it starts pulling it out to bring it back into line roughly once it hits that 50% range then it'll turn the fan off and then for heat it would be at least 70 degrees in there that's my least line that I would want in there it gives them a good buffer zone because they can survive down to, you know, 40, 50s, but you could start running into die off, so you don't want that to happen. So that 70 range is really good. It also keeps them very productive cleaning skulls. I did experiment having it at a higher temperature, which I tried 80, I tried 90, and I also tried 100 degrees. Each of those, once you kept going up in temperature, each time they got more productive. So if you need skulls done quicker, move it up to 80 or 90. The 100 range I won't go at or above that because then you can start running into die-offs as well. But that 90 range is where I found they were most efficient cleaning skulls. They're just very heat feeders, I guess is the word, where once they're nice and heated up, they're ready to go out and eat. A lot of people were also wondering, what if the humidity drops before? below that range? What if it drops down to 30% or 20% or 10%? That's never going to hurt the beetles. I've had it where it was 10% in the enclosure. Humidity is not something that's going to hurt them if it's too low. Only if it's too high because they can start getting mites, they can get mold, stuff like that. If you guys enjoy this type of content, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button. And also, we do have a merch shop below the video. Be sure to check that out for some nice merch. And it does help us out and continues to grow our channel. Now back to the video. Another question that I received was, do you need to put water in there for the beetles? Or do you need to put it on cotton balls? Or what do you do? In the entire duration that I had my beetles, I did not put one thing of water in there for them to consume on its own. What I had was frozen skulls that I had in the freezer for at least two weeks because it stops any bugs that were laying into it from living because that two week mark is where everything will die off regardless. So nothing's going to happen where you start getting flies in your enclosure or something like that. So try never to put fresh things in the enclosure. And then what I would do is I would take those, put them into the enclosure directly. Sometimes I would let it defrost for, you know, 30, 45 minutes outside of the enclosure, then place them in. But those skulls were pretty moist in themselves, so it kept everything hydrated that way. But you don't want to leave it out too long where it dries out too far. And also, all the flies in your area are going to lay eggs, and then you're going to have flies in your enclosure, which is not fun. You don't want to do that. The final question that I got was, what do you do if you don't have enough to feed them? A lot of people use dog food or cheap hot dogs to feed them in order to get by. Beetles are very easy going. They can last a week to two weeks without food. Yes, it's going to hamper your generational gap for sure, where they're not going to be eating as much for a certain period of time. But if you have to start leaning them off, that's definitely something that you can do. But what I had was, I didn't have enough skulls to run them 
just on skulls 24 7. I had a lot of skulls which was very nice but then I moved on to getting cow skulls from a local butcher. I did pay a little bit for them obviously because it is something that they had to set aside. They had to take time out of their day for me but all that meat off of that skull I would cut pieces off and somewhat meal sized pieces for them, freeze it all for two weeks. I would also have them eat the cow skull as well, which was a very good portion of their food that would last about five days on there. And then all that extra meat off of the cow skull I could place in there at a later time. How you go about talking to your butcher about this is I would go reach out to them, let them know that you do have beetles. You're looking to do something with the skulls that they get whether it's pigs or cows, and you'd even clean one up for them so they can have one at home. Most of the time, they aren't doing anything with it. It's a waste and they have to get rid of it anyways, and they have to pay to get rid of it. But if you can try to do something for them where it's nice, and it's not something that's gonna take time out of their day, definitely recommend doing that. Thank you guys for watching this video of outdoor experiences. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave it down below and we'll catch you on the next one.